My name is Thomas Tolliver, better known as St. Thomas. Uh, I was born here in Charleston, a place called South Hills, in 1933. Something I'm somewhat proud of. So I've been around here next month. I'll be around here 89 years with the exception of my stink in the military. I was in the third entry division. You know, um, it's strange. I never thought about it when I was coming up. Uh, it was so segregated, but the people were so nice, it was hard to detect. Uh, one thing that, 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 that I marvel at is that I used to plow with a horse, cut grass, everything all over South Hills. I remember one particular family in particular. They would let me take their little girl on the back of my horse ride all through the woods, every, all through the, everywhere. I spent everywhere with this little white girl. But when I got ready to get water, I had to go to the back door. Isn't that strange? But I never, it, I, it didn't resonate with me then, but I, as I got older, I said, boy, that's strange. Why would they let me take their little daughter everywhere? But when I got ready to go to get water, and I wouldn't dare call their names because they were good people. But that's just the way segregated work, you know, and that the people were so nice that you sort of overlook being the segregated part. There's a place, we, bought, we finally bought a house in South Hills. I'm gonna pull that deed out one day to prove the point. But we finally bought a house in South Hills and on that road is that they said, at that time, you know, they called us Negroes. And I wanna get that deed to prove it. I don't wanna, you know, issue a bunch of lies. But, I would like to get that deed to show they said if Negroes ever bought this house, they could shut the road down. So, You know, I appreciated my daddy so much. Totally opposite from my daddy. My daddy was a good man, and uh, uh, what I marveled about him, the way he was treated, and said, he said this it was in his home, it, heaven, so it didn't matter to him. But I was more of a rough and rebel. And I didn't realize years later, my uh, mother never liked intermarriage, or didn't like me uh, having white friends. Girl. And later on I found out she was from an Irish background. So, you know, segregation and all that is so crazy when you begin to really analyze it and see what we went through as black people but then see how we progressed even during segregation. Some of the best people came out, and you know that. And so I saw that with my daddy and my brothers. Like I said, I didn't want to be derogatory or for, 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 uh, for, I just didn't want to be funny about this comment, but you never seen a toddler in a welfare line or an employment line, none. It was, uh, uh, three girls and three girls and uh, I had and four boys. We never, I think daddy invented the dust to dawn light uh, because we'd be out working. He always had something for us to do. And so I think that trickled on down to my family is that he had a, I mean, I mean, I mean he was, he was definitely biblical. If you don't work, you don't eat. He meant that. So all of us ate. And that's trickled down to my family and as to the people you know that I deal with in the street. That's been a carryover to me, you know. And it's meant so much by me working, although I liked alcohol and everything that a man liked, but those work ethics kept me out of a lot of trouble. And, you, well, okay, I'll tell you. He invented the dust of dawn light if we wasn't cutting grass, and this documented somewhere where I used to plow all over South Hills with a horse, cut down trees, rake leaves, uh, landscape work. Uh, I think the strangest thing, I think my, took my daddy, I don't know if you ever heard of an old Model T Ford or not, but my, my daddy took an old Model T Ford, got a conversion fit, and made a plow out of it. And after he plowed, then he converted it back and made a sawmill out of it. It had a, 
had the wheel on the back was the pulley and hooked it up to so then we made a saw mill and we cut what you call cord wood now they sell wood you know by the truck but back there then we sold it by the even on short or long so we cut wood and i think the funniest thing we ever made during the war uh carbide uh used um uh coal which had a lot of cinders and he would go down there he started making cinder blocks so you know back there then people worked everybody worked you know so uh, i marveled at that because back there then i hated it but now it's trickled down to my family and everybody that i work with you know that issue came up about busing you remember when that came up i found that so marvelous is that i was born and reared on south hills there was an elementary school called fernbank now fernbank was only a block from my house. I couldn't go there. So I had to come all the way down in Charleston, bypass Fernbank, walk off of South... Well, there was a, a black school in South Hills, a little elementary school there, but they, it was limited. There was a, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the black school, but the white school was Fernbank, and it was well known, very prestigious. Uh, we weren't allowed to go there, and so, but we would go either to that little black one-room school on Oakmont, or we would come down to a school called Bud that's located on, Jacob Arbors is there now. So we'd pass that big school called Fernbank. Either we'd go to this little black school or Negro school, they would call it, on Oakmont, or we would go to Boyd school that was on Jacob Street. We went to Boyd because it offered more. The one up on, was a one, one room and all the black kids went to it but we would pass one of the most prestigious schools in this state called Fernbank. I hope they don't get me for this but there was great camaraderie mean the blacks and the whites because in certain conditions they was just if some of them as poor as we were so on that line like I marvel at some of the things that the rich whites told me. Some of the whites that I ran with, they didn't want them in their yard. They just didn't want to associate with them. But bringing out the gangster in me, I used to run with a bunch of white guys. And there's up in Kanoi City at that time, there was a big service station. So we'd pick up these white guys, my brother and I, and we'd ride around. But then we'd walk in the service station like that, and people would be following us all behind. But what was it? it was a decoy. While we was out there, they was following us. The white boys was out there still in oil and everything. But we was a decoy. And for years, they didn't catch on to that. So that, that's how crazy segregation was. You know, it's similar to that now, that if you go in a store, a black and a white guy, a black man, they mo most of the time, a lot of not, it's sort of back, they'll go to the white guy. Well, that's what would happen when we would go into a service station or gr they'd follow us around, you know, we'd look all thuggish like. And they'd follow us like, but while we was following, the white guys was robbing them blind. So that's the funny part about it. Oh, by the way, I, uh, I, I won't talk too much about my military experience unless you ask me, but. Uh, he was talking about how I was being segregated against. I remember when I was called in the military and I was thrown in there because of some stuff I got into, but I got in the military and I went to Beckley to be inducted in. So anyway, when we got ready to go into the military, I was the only black guy in my group. So what happened, I walked into, we, they, they all stopped to feed us. So the, the, the restaurant told all of them they could eat up front, but I had to go in the back. Now you gotta remember segregationists, but I appreciate them West Virginia guys so much. They said, if he has to go in the back, we'll get back on the bus, and that's what they did. I marveled at that. You know, One of the things, that, during my military, one of the things that I found out, two things I didn't find in a foxhole was an atheist and a racist. Well, you know, the military played a tremendous role. Actually, it was one of the, it played a bigger role in integration than uh, all your other little groups who promoted it, but the military. And I guess you know why, though. 
why the military, my thinking was, is that if we fought something, if we was like Korea or, or various nations that were dark nations, if the blacks were captured, they would tell the black guys, we're not your enemy. And things like that really upset the black commanders because they knew eventually that was going to get to them. So they integrated the army. The army was integrated in 19, during the Korean War. Well, Truman had actually, Eisenhower had served in Korea. And I want to get this story right. They captured a bunch of black soldiers and white soldiers, and they separated them. And so, actually, you know, the Chinese was behind the war. In, so they separated them. Then they tried to get the black guys to come out and fight the white. They said, oh, no, we're American soldiers. Well, that bothered Eisenhower so much when he came back and was president. Then, you know, he integrated that school. He was the one that sent troops to Little Rock. You remember that? But it was Eisenhower. It was the military who who really bought about, if you study it, it show it was the middle. And they still play a very important role. Some of the best jobs that blacks get is even in the military. In fact, you're aware that I had three generals in my family. My niece served under Austin, who is the secretary now. So the military played a tremendous part in integration, even today. The roughest one, and it deserves more attention, was Little Rock, the, was uh, uh, the school out there, that, that pool out there, what was Lock, Rock Lake Pool, you remember that? Oh man, you should open that up. Rock Lake Pool tried to integrate, and blacks and whites marched hard again. It was a hard thing, it's called Rock Lake Pool. So when they demanded that they would let uh, Negroes in, they call in. When they made a demand to let them in Rock Lake, that's why Rock Lake Pool is shut down to this day. If they demanded that they let blacks go, because what was happening, uh, black and white kids have always played together. So I remember one lady in particular, when she tried to take her black friend there and they wouldn't let in, boy, she almost called a riot within herself. But that, that story should be brought to the attention of how hard segregation was here. Of course, you know, some of the schools too, like Stonewall, various schools had little mini riots uh, 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 when, when blacks would try to enter. But that Rock Lake uh, pool store should be revived and really be told the whole story. The church played a very important role. I'll be true, without the church, I like to have to say, personally, I don't know how to made it. It's been more of a sort of, would you say, restoration station, and the church has played such an important role in my life. I know it play, 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 uh, played a great role in my daddy and mother's life, but, but for me, the church, I don't know, I, actually I can see why people on drugs or commit suicide because if you can't come to the church and receive comfort, uh, uh, welcome, where else can you go? You, there's no place else you can go. That's why bars are so full, because it's, there's no substitute for the church. Me personally, I got saved at the Bible Center in 1968 on the boulevard. So for years I went to uh, the Bible Center on the boulevard. The Bible Center and my, 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 my brother-in-law and, and sister went to the Bible Center. James and Ruth Page. But now, what a lot of people don't know, the Bible Center, to a degree, had always been integrated. It, I mean, way back on the founders, uh, so it's always been semi-integrated. So I got saved on the boulevard at the Bible Center. Well, then the Bible Center moved to South Hills. A lot of people thought then it was a little harder to get to South Hills than it was when it was on the boulevard. So my brother-in-law and a sister and a few more people says, let's just start an inner city church. 
and so as we began to start and plan for the inner city church, a lot of people thought it was because of, it wasn't, it was because of the area of difference. It was where the Bible Center at that time was on Oakwood. Well, the old Bible Center was right here on the main thoroughfare. So we wanted to make it so everyone could attend. There's nothing special about Grace Bible other than it uh, preaches the Word of God. There are nice churches here, First Baptist, uh, Metropolitan, uh, Emmanuel, there are a lot, but Grace Bible Church was just established to preach the Bible. And we did not want to be what you would call separatists. And we wanted to be in such an area that, and preach as it's always had from Reverend Stoner to Reverend Lavender, Reverend Hoskins, and then you, it, it, it followed out what we really wanted to talk, just the Bible. And that's why it's called Grace Bible. And all those ministers have done that, including you. I'd like to say something nice about you, but I don't want you to get the big head. But I'm, you cannot imagine what this church has done to me. If I tell you about what it's done, you wouldn't consider it bragging, would you? You won't? Look what, it, you know what it's done. This church has caused me to work in the prison ministry for 30 years. It's caused me right now to do some work with some Fort Nepalese people. It's caused me to serve on the Union mission, all because of what I've learned here. You're saved to serve, not to sit. And that's what it's meant. It's meant so much to all of my children, you know. Uh, this church as to what's been taught here, biblical principles. And I love, like to, I always like to say this when people tell me they don't believe in the Bible, they don't believe in the church. Then I said, do you have an automobile? They said, yes. I said, what happens if you get, if what happens if it gets out of line? What do you do? We get it realigned, right? I said, well, do you think man was made without some way, if he gets out of line, how to get realigned? Where is it? It's the church and the Bible. So, that, I meant, you ought to think, do you think man was made without some sort of instructions? And it's the word of God. And that's what the Bible, this is what Grace Bible does. And, and Jesus said, if I be lift, he'll draw. You lift, he'll draw. And that's what it's meant so much to my seven kids and 30 grandkids. You just interviewed my wife. She told you how much this church it meant to us. Matthew 9, 2 said a woman had an issue of blood. 12 years, right? You preached that. And, and my favorite verse used to be Philippians 5, 13. I can, but my favorite verse resonates with me is this woman who had an issue of blood 12 years and she touched Jesus. And Jesus said, somebody touched me. His disciples said, duh, everybody. He said, no, somebody touched me. So what this church says to me, it gives me an opportunity not to bump into Jesus, but touch him. So what we need to do as Christians, just get them to Jesus, he'll do the rest. Did he not do the rest? 12 years? If I keep talking, I'm gonna be like you, I'm gonna take up an offering. But my favorite verse is that we're all going through issues and what our duty is to get them to Jesus, he'll do the rest. We, there's an issue of COVID-19, that's an issue. I can't pay, all, there are issues issues of problems that we sometimes we can't resolve but we can go to the resolver who is Jesus Christ so that's become my favorite thing everyone is going through some issues I think about the disciples when he was out on a in the sea and Jesus was back in the boat sleep and a storm came up that was an issue and they didn't know what to do but they knew Jesus was asleep so they woke him up and he says, he said, you don't care to let us perish? There's an issue there. So what to do? They got to Jesus. He resolved the issue. If he's not weak, if, he's, if he doesn't calm the storm, at least he'll give you peace in it. So I would say to people here, come to church if, and get to, let, let pastor, whoever's preaching, get you to Jesus and let him do the rest.